In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Being that this is Stewardship Sunday, I want not only to reflect on Christian stewardship, but even to see ourselves as a coin. And this comes from the parable Jesus taught, the kingdom parable, when he said that the kingdom of heaven is like a woman with ten coins. And one of them was lost, which when found, not only did she rejoice, but also did the angels rejoice at the finding of the lost coin. About this parable, uh, the seventh century church father, St. Gregory the Great, who was very influential upon all of Western Christianity, he gave his voice of interpretation to this parable of the lost coin. And in brief, he said that the woman represents Holy Church. The nine coins of the ten were the nine orders of holy angels. And the, the tenth coin, the one that was lost, was humanity, human beings, us, and all, and all humans. And so, in essence, he invites us to reflect on ourselves as a coin. And so that's why I'm going to do so. First, though, considering our gospel passage today. When, after Jesus asks for a coin, he then asks the Pharisees, whose likeness and inscription is on this coin? As is indicated by St. Matthew, the Pharisees were trying to entangle Jesus, to trap him so that they would have grounds to arrest him. He who was a very popular figure as he did his ministry, ministry of teaching about scripture and teaching about God, of course, and his ministry of healing, miracles, and the rest. Popular figure in and around Jerusalem. And so the thought was, if they could trap Jesus and, and get him to say, well, just don't pay your taxes, then that would be the grounds that they were looking for. But by this time, our Lord is quite used to the Pharisees trying to trick him. Happens many times in the Gospel accounts. And he often, uh, in these cases, responded to their question with another question, a question that would undermine what they were doing and expose what they were doing, um, showing what they were doing to be superficial, their question to be a red herring, and really a distraction from what they were really after, their real purpose, which was not truth, but to arrest him. Politics, in other words. Sometimes it's either truth or politics, but often it's not both. So Jesus' question, whose likeness and inscription is on this coin, or the, other, the word here is also image. Whose image is on this coin, whose inscription is on this coin, forced them to answer. Jesus, as they say, put the ball into their court. And, of course, he exposed them and their real purpose, which is why they just slunk away. What's notable about the particular question our Lord asked was that, for us, it has a deeper scriptural significance. And so Jesus is asking, whose image and whose writing is on this coin? And the answer is that Caesar's image and Caesar's inscription is on the coin. His inscription meaning it's a product of the empire which he's in charge of. It's government stamped, government issued. And the government is Caesar. And so because of that, the coin goes to Caesar. Simple logic. But if we think of ourselves, as St. Gregory the Great would have us do, as coins, 
this becomes a very uh, significant scriptural moment because whose image and inscription is written upon us? Well, Genesis has something to say about this. Are we not in God's image? And his image is in us, and we are of his image. And who wrote upon us? Well, Jeremiah 31, 33 has something to say about that. God declaring these words, I will put my law within them, and I will write it upon their hearts. I will be their God, he says, and they shall be my people. And so if things are to be given, offered, to those whose image is on the thing, whatever the thing may be, then, yes, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, render to the government the things that have government all over them, but to God, things that are God's. And so I think, in part, this is why they marveled. I think they were confused, but also they were outdone by the word of God, something they professed, the Pharisees professed, to be experts in. And so this idea that human beings are like a coin lost, searched for, and when found, rejoiced over by angels and by the church becomes a key, I'm, t I'm saying, to understanding Christian stewardship. We are a coin, and we are made by God. God made us so that, as a coin of great value, also we would, of our own free will, choose to offer ourselves back to him. Back to him who is the maker of all creatures, great and small. And this also is what our patron is after in his famous teaching, which I usually or often try to incorporate into my preaching because it's so important. St. Paul's teaching of living sacrifice means the same thing. And our liturgy takes it up, which indicates how important Paul's teaching is. He, our liturgy takes up Paul's teaching when we say, and here we offer and present unto thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls and bodies, to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice, offering ourselves, choosing to offer ourselves. And what does it mean to offer ourselves, but to offer to God our time, our talent, and our treasure, because that is what we are made of in this world in a practical sense. Our time, our talent, and our treasure is simply what it means to offer ourselves, our souls, and bodies. It's in just different words. And so this is an important teaching that we, that we are aware that God made us with free will to choose to offer ourselves back to him. And in that sense, we are that tenth coin that is lost until we are found, and not only God finding us and church finding us, but we finding ourselves and our true identity as made in God's image with his law written in our hearts. Now, lest we think that stewardship is simply something of the modern world, that vestries ask their rector to preach upon so that we have enough money for the next year. Although, it's partly that. It's a fundamental teaching of the church. And we see, and I say that because it's seen in the very first days of the church, captured by St. Luke in the Acts of the Apostle, in the very dramatic account of Ananias and his wife, Sapphira. This is Acts chapter 5. They were the ones, a married couple, who seeming to have a means of some kind, a significant landowners, uh, they were following the example of St. Barnabas and others who were selling all they had, giving the proceeds to the church so that distribution could be made to those in need, and as well as to support the church. Because, you know, the lights always have to be on. 
Well, Ananias and Sapphira are brought into the story kind of out of nowhere by St. Luke, and they were told that they sell their property, but we're also told that they kept back some of their proceeds. And the implication is not that they kept it back because they needed it to put food on the table and, and a roof over their head. They, the, that's assumed that we would keep that for what we need to survive. It's the extra stuff. And so they had quite a bit of proceeds left over that they, that they could have and should have given to the church, and, but did not. And we're told that St. Peter looked upon them and in very, a very memorable moment, what Peter saw was Satan filling their heart because they were lying to the Holy Spirit. And Luke then says that both Sapphira and Ananias on separate moments, they weren't together when this happened, there was one after the other, that they both fell down and they dropped dead right in front of Peter and right in front of the church. Why? It's their greed. Simple as that. They didn't need to hold on to all that they had. They take some and give the rest if they're going to be part of the church, which was how the church was operating at that time. It's a dramatic story, perhaps too dramatic for us today. And so what can we take from this? Well, the part I want to bring out is that it should teach us something. That knowingly holding back from God or from the church, which is where God, in our case, is, knowingly holding back from God our time, talent, and treasure, which we have available to give, is something that God sees, and he doesn't like it. God, who, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, from whom no secrets are hid, can't keep back this kind of secret or any secret from God. Holding back from the church that which God knows that we have available to offer, whether it's time or whether it's t talent or whether it's treasure, and choosing not to offer it, God regards negatively, I'll just say. And if the story of Ananias and Sapphira have, have any kind of um, significance for us, Let's say also that because he regards that negatively, he'll withhold his active presence in our lives. And when God withholds his presence from our lives in Paul's teaching, that's just like being dead. Because to not have a relationship with, with, with God is spiritual death. Our heart is cold and all sorts of other unpleasant things. Well, dear brothers and sisters, as I've said many times in the past and as I undoubtedly will say many times in the future, all God wants is the human heart. Knowing that God made us so that we would of our own free will choose to offer ourselves back to him is what stewardship is based on. Because when we know that we are made in God's image and that he has written his law upon our hearts, that our whole existence rests in his grace, how can we not offer whatever time, talent, and treasure we have available back to God? We must all one day give account to God about how we have managed that which has been given to us by God, whether we have been faithful stewards of the bounty of time, talent, and treasure God has given to each one of us. And so let us understand that by our stewardship, we honor God. By our stewardship, we honor the church who rejoices over every coin that is found. By our stewardship, we honor Jesus Christ and his unfathomable gift of eternal life, which he gave to us and gives to us by his sacrifice in his incarnation, even becoming human, as well as, of course, his sacrifice 
on the cross for our eternal life. We are made in God's image. His image is always and indelibly upon us. And His Holy Spirit is written upon our hearts. We are God's. And as poor as we might be, as the Christmas hymn goes, no matter how poor we might be, we may always, and we always are able, to give Him our heart. Amen.